Well, good evening. I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 10. And we are coming now to the last vision of the book of Daniel. This last section encompasses chapters 10, 11, and 12. And this chapter, or this section, this last vision, was given to Daniel in 536 to 535 B.C., Some 70 years after Daniel himself was deported off to Babylon, Daniel is probably 85 years old at this point, and this last vision portrays the history of Israel from this point forward, from the Persian period through the end of the current age. There are significant highlights in the in the time of the Greeks with Antiochus Epiphanes, and then a significant climax with the description, more detailed description of the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. And all of this in this great book of Daniel culminates in the coming of Messiah to the earth to establish his kingdom. Chapter 10 is an introduction to this last vision. So in 21 verses... Uh, This evening, we're not going to get to the vision itself. We're just going to cover the setup of this vision. And and God has seen fit to give us 21 verses of anticipation leading up to this vision. Let's read together Daniel chapter 10. And and we'll read all the way through Daniel chapter 11 and verse 1. I believe that's the section. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel who was named Belteshazzar. And the message was true and one of great conflict. But he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. On the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body was also like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision. Yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground." Then, behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I am about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the last days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And behold, this one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke to him and said said to the one who was standing before me, O my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. He said, O man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Now as soon as he spoke to me, I received my strength and said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. 
However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. This is a remarkable chapter with many confusing details. As we've seen in this book, Daniel has been concerned for the spiritual state of the people of Israel. And as they have returned to the land, will they return to the Lord? That is Daniel's pressing question. As a nation, will they be circumcised of heart? Will they welcome in the messianic era and the blessings of Yahweh's promises? Will they live in the land and be fulfilled in all that God said he would do for them as a people? Notice in verse 1 of Daniel 10, this is the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. That is two years after the vision of chapter 9. This is after the return of the exiles to Israel. The, the first wave of people have returned. And this is near to the time that Daniel was thrown into the den of lions. Remember, Daniel was in his mid-80s in the den of lions. Now, why would Daniel not have gone back to the land of Israel with the initial wave of returnees? Hadn't he set his face toward Jerusalem? Hadn't he prayed toward Jerusalem three times daily? Wasn't his heart there? Wasn't he homesick for the special dwelling place of God? Why did Daniel not go back? A number of reasons have been suggested. One is simply that he was old. Uh, that certainly is a possibility. One may be that he was concerned about the spiritual condition of the Israelites, those who had already gone back to Jerusalem. Uh, no doubt a couple of years had passed since Ezra uh, described the events in the land. This is Ezra 4, 5, that people had hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. That's a second Darius. And then Ezra 4.24 says, The work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased, and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. It's quite possible that Daniel would have received word of these things and been concerned about the progress of the land. He could have seen his strategic place in the land of Babylon, uh, still in the Persian administration, to help his people. And it could be because he had a high government job and was seen as important that they didn't let him go. Uh, we're not told why Daniel didn't go back, but certainly those would be good reasons. Verse 2 of Daniel chapter 10 tells us that Daniel had been mourning for three entire weeks. Uh, it says literally he was mourning for three sevens of days. Of course, that's a contrast to what we looked at last time with sevens of years. This is a week as we know it with three sevens of days. And Daniel here subsisted on some bare rations. Look at verse 3. I did not eat any tasty food. That is, he didn't eat the king's table food. Nor did meat or wine enter my mouth. Nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. So Daniel didn't take care of himself with delicious food, uh, nor with the common things like aftershave, cologne, moisturizers that would be necessary in a desert climate. And all of these things because Daniel is disturbed of soul. He's disturbed by the future of Israel. This vision that he has seen, as we will see in the coming weeks, is the future history of Israel, which is filled of conflict and tumult. There will be no peace for a long time to come. There will be wars and difficulties. And this cuts against the heart of the prophet's desire for the spiritual restoration of God's covenant people. Notice verse 4, Daniel has found himself on the banks of the Tigris River. On the 24th day of the first month, I was at the bank of the great river that is the Tigris. The Euphrates River, of course, ran right through the town, uh, but the Tigris was at the closest about 20 miles away. Uh, you could travel 200 miles away downstream to another part, but it doesn't mean that Daniel had to travel far to be on the banks of the river. But we'll see as, a, as this uh, scene unfolds that Daniel has not been transported there by a vision, but he is actually there and sees a vision there on the banks of the Tigris River. The second scene here is Daniel's visitation. I forgot to tell you we were already at point one. We're past it now. Point two. <laughs> Daniel gets a visitor. This is verses five through nine. 
I lifted my eyes and looked, Daniel writes, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Behold, that startling word, uh, occurs four times in this chapter. Over and again, there is something to be startled by. And this scene is startling. Daniel is visited here by some heavenly visitor. Who is this visitor? This could be an unnamed angel uh, who comforted Daniel. Uh, we're going to see an unnamed angel comforting Daniel beginning in verse 10. This could be that same angel. And if it's the same angel that has given Daniel announcements in the past, the same angel that will announce the coming of Messiah in the future, then this would be Gabriel. And many commentators have supposed that this is Gabriel. Or this could be someone else altogether, some other angel. Or this could be a theophany, a Christophany, a a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ himself. And I think there are a number of reasons to take that view. I'm not sure I'm 100% convinced this is a Christophany, but I'll tell you uh, what are my sort of tentative evidences leaning toward that. First of all, Daniel's reaction here it is much like the reaction of others who have come into the presence of God uncloaked, falling down as a man like Isaiah 6 or Revelation chapter 1 with the Apostle John. I think there's a differentiation between this being in verses 5 through 9 and what happens in verses 10 and following in the rest of the chapter. The angelic beings we see there beginning in verse 10 need help from each other and are waylaid in their purposes by demonic forces. I would suggest to you that no such thing could happen if that were Christ. So if we are to see Christ in verses 5 through 9, we would see a different character appearing in verse 10. And then I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 1. I, I believe this is an interesting parallel. At least the imagery is the same. And in Revelation chapter 1, it is no mistaking that we see there the resurrected, glorified Christ. And this is John the Revelator, John the Apostle, uh, who is receiving the book of Revelation. In the first chapter of Revelation, he gets a glimpse of, of Christ and and remember that John the apostle was the uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved there was a special affection that Jesus had in his earthly ministry for John and John could never get over the love of Christ for him and so he referred to himself often in the third person as the disciple whom Jesus loved just always amazed that Christ would love one such as him he has a similar role to Daniel, and, and perhaps he gets a similar vision of the person of Christ. Listen to this description, beginning in Revelation 1, verse 13. You may be following along. In the middle of the lampstands, John writes, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. It is clear in Revelation 1 that the one whom John sees is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there are significant similarities here. Dressed in white, a golden sash, eyes like torches of fire. In Daniel, it is said his arms and legs are like burnished bronze. In Revelation 1, it is his legs and feet as burnished bronze, and then the voice in Daniel 10, like the sound of a tumult, and in Revelation 1, like the sound of many waters. I don't know if you've been in Yellowstone National Park and been at Yellowstone Falls and the Little Grand Canyon there. Uh, maybe you've heard that sound of that water pouring off the precipice and just cracking on the rocks beneath. It is deafening. 
and you can't really talk to each other when you're standing next to that? What would it be like to be in the presence of one whose voice sounded like that and whose face in Daniel 10 shone like lightning? Have you ever held your eyes open close to a bolt of lightning? I hope not. Uh, That happened to me once in East Tennessee in a Bolt of lightning destroyed the tree about 20 yards away from the front porch of the house while me and my roommates were all standing out there watching it. It was terrifying. (laughs) What would it be like to see one whose face shone like the sun? These parallels are at least interesting. You remember that in Acts chapter 9, Paul saw the resurrected Jesus. He heard the resurrected Jesus. And those around him did not see him, but heard a voice, and they were terrified and speechless. Here, Daniel's companions neither see see nor hear. Nevertheless, great dread fell on them, Daniel 10, 7, and they ran away to hide themselves, Daniel says, so I was left alone. Really a remarkable scene. And whether Daniel here is seeing an angelic being that is sort of wearing and emanating the glories of heaven, or whether he is seeing the pre-incarnate Christ, Daniel is face down in the Hebrew text, literally groundward on his face. In verse 10, we get a third scene in this chapter, and it is comfort. Daniel is comforted here by another person, an unnamed being, some angelic being. And and many commentators have said this is Gabriel. And and I'll stick with the name Gabriel just so I don't have to say he and that guy and that angel. Although the text doesn't tell us it's Gabriel per se. It's just perhaps easier to refer to him that way. I, I think there's good ground to probably believe it's Gabriel. In chapter 12, this one standing and comforting Uh, Daniel is seen above the river in linen garments and seems to be in charge of other angels. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 and verse 21, another angel, Michael, is named, and then two other angels for a total of four. Michael, this angel, perhaps he's Gabriel, and two other unnamed angels are seen together in chapter 12. And we've already seen Gabriel named and having important positions in this book. So uh, there's reasonable... um, there, there is reason to, to ha- perhaps think this is Gabriel. Notice in verse 10, this hand touched Daniel and set him trembling, literally on his knees and the open palms of his hand. He is just there shaking on the ground. This angel touches him. And this is the first of three attempts for this angelic being to give Daniel strength. Daniel is this prophet who must receive explanation of this vision. He must get direct revelation from heaven about what is to happen to God's people. And he needs to be strong enough to hear it, to comprehend it, to understand it, to write it down. And so this attempt at comfort meets this aged prophet of God trembling on his hands and knees. Verse 11, he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, or O Daniel, greatly beloved... Understand the words that I'm about to tell you. Stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. This would be comforting words. Daniel is greatly loved of God. This sounds like the epithet given to John the Apostle, the beloved of the Lord. And this comfort is followed by the command, understand the words. And what will come out in this vision is significant, specific detail of the unfolding of the Grecian Empire after the close of the Old Testament canon, followed by the climactic events during the Great Tribulation and more details about the Antichrist. And Daniel here is commanded to understand them. That tells us something about the nature of God's word and its perspicuity. God intended for it to be understood. And as historians can look back at that intertestamental period and watch the unfolding of the Grecian empires and all the various players, and we look back at Daniel chapter 11, we will find once again that God in predictive prophecy gives exquisite detail. And that's a lesson for us because we can look back at what was predicted and what was fulfilled in exquisite detail. And then we can look at predictive prophecy that is yet unfulfilled and believe it in its detail as well. So the command came to understand the words. 
And when he had spoken this, the end of verse 11, I stood up trembling. Daniel is still here shaking. Shaking perhaps because of the vision uh, of the future events and also with the encounter with that heavenly being in the first part of this chapter. Verse 12, this angel said to Daniel, do not be afraid. Don't fear, Daniel. And then he goes on to describe how Daniel's own prayers have been answered. Look at this in verse 12. From the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to your words. So Daniel gets this terrifying vision of the unfolding of future events of calamities for Israel. That means, first of all, they're not going back into the land post-exile to get all the blessings. They might be going back into the land, but they're not yet ready of heart for Messiah's kingdom. More wars are coming. More empires are coming. And a succession of tumults and conflicts for the nation. That makes Daniel tremble. And so... Don't fear, your prayers have been answered. What has Daniel been doing since he saw the vision? For 21 days, praying. And notice how the angel describes this. From the first day that you set your heart on understanding, Daniel knew this is important, I need to understand this, and he begins to pray. How did the angel describe it? You humbled yourself before the face of your God. What did that humbling himself look like? Outpouring of his heart before God. Not eating, not taking the delicacies that were available to him, and not taking care of himself. No anointing oil. Uh, Those comforts were taken away. You can see Daniel just sick to his stomach and eager for God to answer prayer. Learn this about prayer from verse 12. The first day Daniel set his heart on humbling himself, he was heard. He was heard. And this angel came. It's not that it took 21 days for God to hear Daniel's prayer. God heard immediately. What took 21 days is for this help to arrive, this answer to the request to understand the vision. And this is so surprising. Look at verse 13. But, the angel says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me. For 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia, and now I have come to give you an answer. What is going on here? The the windows of history have been opened up, so we get a behind the scenes look into some of the things that are really going on. This is a remarkable scene. If this is Gabriel here, then he is the named angel who gave significant messages from God to his people. He seems to be in charge of the other angels in verse 12. And and he would therefore be some sort of an archangel, a high-ranking angel. And he is said to be detained, held up, withstood by someone called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Michael is called a prince. Michael the archangel is called a prince. This other character is called a prince. I believe this is also an angelic being. And this is an angelic being who is getting in the way of God's angelic beings. That makes him a bad angel. This would be a demon. Perhaps Satan himself. Perhaps one of Satan's strong demons under his reign. And he is called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. We find out in verse 20 that who, this angel that's speaking with Daniel, uh, we'll call him Gabriel, he has to go back and fight with the prince of Persia again after describing to Daniel what's going on here. This prince of Persia must be an angelic being, an enemy. Persia is the world empire at this point, and, and Israel's history is in the balance of what happens in this world empire. And so it seems that God's high, or maybe his highest ranking angel, is at work against significant evil spiritual forces. And notice in verse 13 that Michael, one of the chief princes, that is one of the top angels, he is a named high ranking angel. Remember that only two angels are named in all of scripture, Michael and Gabriel. 
And, and Michael, this high-ranking angel in God's arsenal, is here to help. Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Notice that kings here is plural. Uh, this is likely other angelic beings. It, it could be a reference to the succession of kings in the Persian Empire that will come uh, just before the Grecian Empire. And, and it would be a recognition that there is a, a demonic force behind the human political forces. But I think this reference to kings of Persia here is a plural reference to more cosmic powers, rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Look at verse 1 of chapter 12. Daniel records there that Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. What do we learn there about Michael the archangel? He is an archangel specifically given to the protection of Israel, your people. Your there is, is plural. Um, he is your prince in verse 21, meaning not just Daniel's prince, but Israel's prince. Michael is mentioned as well in Jude chapter 9 in the New Testament, and he's referred to in Revelation 12, 7, depicted in a cosmic spiritual war in heaven against Satan and his angels. Revelation chapter 12 is still future from our vantage point, and that is the scene where Satan is finally and fully cast out of heaven forever during the great tribulation and never allowed back. You remember that Satan even now is called the accuser of the brethren. That is, he makes his way into the throne room of God and accuses the saints before heaven's courtroom. But there is a day coming when Michael, the archangel, will wage war against Satan and his demons and cast them out. And the text there in Revelation 12 says, because Satan wasn't strong enough for Michael. This would be a tremendous comfort to Daniel. What's happening in verse 13? This remarkably strong angel has help from an angel that's stronger than Satan and his demons, who is given the specific task of being the protector of the political, geographical, physical nation of Israel. God's people have strong help. You might be wondering, well, why is there a battle at all? I mean, can angels be hurt? What do their injuries look like? Do they, uh, do they need a reset? Do they, I mean, what, how, what does this actually look like? We don't know. In God's providence, we know that God has allowed Satan to be the small g God of this world. That doesn't mean that Satan is stronger than God or we're in some sort of cosmic battle whose outcome we do not know. Just like all things, God is working out all things according to his plan. That includes the cosmic forces of evil, the spiritual forces of darkness. And if God has seen fit that an evil angel would hold up human history and even be involved as God's means of working out the affairs of geopolitics, then that is God's plan and he's sovereign. What's remarkable here is we get the unfolding of events in their details, meaning no demon can thwart the outcome. They will happen exactly as God has commanded. And we see that throughout biblical history, do we not? Evil men plan things for evil, but God intends it for good. Evil men crucified Christ, but this was God's foreordained plan. And you think about Satan's role in this. Satan was a murderer from the beginning. He sought to cut off the seed line, since the seed line promise was given in Genesis 3.15, by inciting a murderer in the first generation, by trying to interfere with the seed line demonically in Genesis chapter 6, by a murderous intent at the seed line traced through the Davidic line all the way through Kings and Chronicles, down to the murderous attempts of Herod to wipe out the seed when he came in Bethlehem by murdering all the boys under two years old. And then by inciting in the heart of Judas, even indwelling Judas, to set up Jesus for a sham trial and have him murdered. 
And what was God doing all along? Bringing Messiah to the earth, faithful to his promises, and seeing that the Messiah would lay down his life as a sin offering at the cross. And all of Satan's attempts to murder Christ culminate in the death of Christ orchestrated by a sovereign God who saw fit to put Christ on a cross in the place of sinners so that we get forgiven, so the seed line promises are fulfilled, and God redeems his humanity through the death of his son. Satan is foiled at every point. Even though Satan is lined up in animosity against God and God's people and his purposes, God wins and uses Satan as his tool. Satan and any demons like the prince of Persia or the kings of Persia, they are all on a short leash in the hand of the sovereign God. I want you to notice something about prayer here in verse 13. Sometimes we pray and God hears immediately and God sends help and help doesn't come on day one or two or three, or four, and I'm not going to count up to 21, but you get the point. Daniel had to wait 21 days for this help that God heard the first moment and sent help right away. And what happens in the meantime? Cosmic spiritual battle. Just means you and I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. This is reminiscent of Job chapter 1. Job faces significant trial, unspeakable trial. And he doesn't know what's happening behind the scenes. We get a window in Job chapter 1. We get a a glimpse into the throne room of heaven. And there is Satan, the accuser of the brethren, making accusations against Job, making accusations against Job's redeemer. And we get to see that window. Job didn't ever get to see that window. And we understand there's a cosmic battle, a theological battle in the heavenly realms where Satan is challenging God and God is proving something not only to Satan but to all of us readers of Job chapter 1 that not even Satan can undo a work of faith in a believer whom God loves. So sometimes we pray, God sends help and we feel our need for three weeks. You know what happens in those three weeks? No prime rib, no wine, no deodorant. And a prophet weeping for his people, mourning before the Lord, grieved over the condition of his people, grieved over uh, politics back in Palestine as the, the enemies of God's people that are preventing the restoration of the temple. And Daniel has to trust and pray and trust and pray for three sevens of days. This is trust multiplied by time. This is waiting on the Lord. And good things happen when we wait on the Lord. God is doing something in the prophet. Even as we read these words and we think about 21 days of agonized fasting and mourning. Anticipating God's answer. We we sit with Daniel here and we think what would that be like? And something is happening in us. And we learn again to rest and to wait and to pray and to wait again. God is doing what God is doing for his purposes. We don't know what those are. In verse 14, the angel says, Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. And the latter days here in the New American Standard Bible simply translates the Hebrew, the afterword of the days, later things. Sometimes we read the latter days, we think the the very, very end. And this will cover the near future and the distant future. Daniel chapter 11 primarily covers the Persian Empire and then the Greek Empire. And then finally we move into the last days and the days of Antichrist to finish out the vision and to finish out the book of Daniel. The fourth scene here is Daniel's strengthening. It begins in verse 15. When he had spoken to me these words, I turned my face toward the ground And became speechless. You think, Daniel, you've already been told to stand up. You've already been told not to fear. And and Daniel here again is, is hearing these words 
and face groundward and dumb, speechless, scared again so that he cannot talk. Verse 16, behold, the one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. Remember, angels already in this book have come in human form. And he touches Daniel's lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to the one who was standing before me, O my Lord, and you see there in your English Bibles, Lord's not capitalized. This is just a Hebrew way to to refer to someone who is of higher rank than you. O my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me and I have retained no strength. I I can't stay strong. I can't speak. And the angel has to touch his lips so that he can speak. And what does he say when he's able to speak? I can't take this. I'm not strong enough for this. Anguish has come upon me. My, My strength has run away from me. It hasn't stayed with me. Verse 17, for how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains now no strength and my breath is gone. I'm I'm breathless again. We feel here Daniel's anguish and the need of this angel to strengthen him these three times in this scene. Look at verse 18. Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. And he said to me, man of high esteem, there literally man greatly beloved, fear not. Do not fear this command. Don't be afraid. That is, don't be afraid of what is to come. I'm here to comfort you. I'm here to strengthen you. Don't be afraid of this vision. And the angel is not going to change the vision. Frankly, the vision is still scary. We'll get through it in the next few weeks. But he says, shalom to you. And, and normally that shalom is a greeting. It's what you say hello and goodbye with. But here it's in the middle of a sentence. It's, it's unique in this setting. And it is, peace be with you. Daniel is still terrified, still trembling. And he needs God's peace. Then the angel says, and the English Bible here says, take courage and be courageous. Uh, it is, be strong and be strong in the Hebrew. This idea of strengthening Daniel comes again and again in this section. As soon as he spoke to me, I received strength and I said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Okay, now you can talk. Now I'm strong enough. Strong enough to what, Daniel? Strong enough to listen. Strong enough to understand. Strong enough to take heed, to take these words in. To record them for our benefit. God's word must be heard. And the prophet needed to be strengthened in order to hear them. Then he said, do you understand why I came to you? And he doesn't answer the question. Apparently Daniel must have nodded. Uh, There's no answer given in this text. This is again a statement of I have come to give you the interpretation of the vision. You need to understand it. Verse 20 he says... But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I'm going forth. And then after that, the prince of Greece is coming. Persia, then Greece. That tells us a couple of things. Um, If he's going to fight the prince of Persia, and then he's going to fight the prince of peace, guess who wins in the battle with the prince of Persia? This angel does. Again, victory is not in doubt. The angel doesn't doubt the outcome. This is all in the sovereign hand of God. And God's faithful servant here, this angelic being, has no doubt about it. There is victory in store. And and after the long battle with Persia, and this will take place for the next couple of centuries, there will come the empire of Greece. And we've already seen in the book of Daniel the awful things that happened through the Grecian Empire, and particularly when the Grecian Empire was split four ways and Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, unleashes uh, at that time an unprecedented persecution against the people of Israel, murdering thousands, stepping into the temple itself and desecrating the temple, claiming to be God. He is, of course, a predecessor, a preview of that final awful blasphemer, Antichrist, who is yet to come. Notice verse 21. 
However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. That is God's book, God's plan, uh, that which God knows this angel is going to tell. And there is one who stands firmly with me against these forces, that is Michael, your prince. I don't think, uh, verse 21 in English kind of makes it sound like um, there's only one angel who's willing to stand against me. This battle is so terrible. This demon is so scary that uh, nobody's willing to stand up to him. Everybody's shaking in their boots. All the angels are scared and they run away and only one guy remained. No, that, that's not the point here. The point here in this passage is, Michael, your prince, that is, yours, Daniel, and Israel's, this strong angel, stronger than Satan and the demons, according to Revelation chapter 12, stands. And he's the only one needed. He's the only one required for this job. He came to help me earlier, and he is going to be there, and he stands firmly with me against these Forces. What forces? All that's coming in the Persian Empire and then all that's coming under the awful time of the Greeks. The section ends with verse 1 of chapter 11. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and a protection for him. This is still the angel speaking. If this is Gabriel, this is Gabriel assigned as a protector for Darius the Mede. Remember when the Medo-Persian Empire upended Babylon and unseated the Babylonian Empire as the world rulers, the world dominators. It was Darius the Mede that learned of Daniel. It was under Darius the Mede that Daniel went into the lion's den and then Darius the Mede that pulled Daniel out of the lion's den. It was Darius the Mede that became a friend. It was Darius the Mede that acknowledged God. And what do we find going on behind the scenes? That this Gabriel, this angelic being, in that time arose to be an encouragement and a protection for a physical, political, Gentile ruler. These are really remarkable things we're seeing here. What do we learn in this chapter? Well, we learn again that God is sovereign. Just like all of the book of Daniel has been leading us to this theme, there is only one God. He is not a regional deity. He is the God of Israel, and he is the maker of heaven and earth. He is therefore God of all gods. He is Lord of all lords. He is the king of all kings, and he is the sovereign orchestrator of all of history. And Make no mistake about it, if he can dictate predictive prophecy for all the world's empires... He is unmistakably and uniquely the one true God. But we learn in this chapter that God answers prayer. God listens to the prayers of his people and he sends timely help. God's schedule may not be our schedule, but he sends timely help. And then the last vision of this prophecy is so detailed. This will unfold in chapters 11 and 12. And this, again, is just a reminder that when we see predictive prophecy in the Bible, we should not write it off to something mysterious and symbolic that cannot be understood, but that God gave predictive prophecy so that we could know, so that we would recognize those events when the time comes. It doesn't mean we can unfold all the details before the time. God gives us the details. He reveals to us what he wants to reveal, and those things will make sense when those details happen. But the details specific to the first coming of Christ ought to give us an indication that the details specific to the second coming of Christ will also be fulfilled quite literally. And the same thing is true of this last vision of Daniel. The exquisite unfolding of details in chapters 11 and 12 will lead us to trust details that are still outstanding. Another thing we learn in this chapter is that God, again, has a plan for Israel, and he uses means to secure that plan. God doesn't need angels. He doesn't need Michael. He doesn't need Gabriel. He doesn't need Daniel the prophet. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He will keep his promises, but God chooses to use means. He has chosen to use means throughout human history. God used means 
to bring you to himself. He used Bible translators to put his own word in your language so you could read it. Perhaps he brought an evangelist, a faithful parent, a Sunday school teacher, a college roommate, a spouse to make the gospel known to you. He didn't need any of those vehicles. He chooses to use means. God has a plan for Israel and he uses means to secure that plan. A fifth thing we learn in this chapter is that there are enemies of God's people. Enemies of God's purposes. They are supernatural. They are powerful. These are spiritual enemies working behind the scenes of human affairs. What does that mean? Polling places don't solve political crises. As if all there is is the physical. Empires come and empires go. And you have to understand that behind the scenes there are demonic forces and there are God's good angelic beings. There is cosmic warfare behind the scenes of human events. We should never boil down history to that which we can merely see and touch. There are bigger things going on than we are aware of. And God's in charge of all of those. We ought not boil down the world's solutions to human contrivances. Angels and demons are real. They are really engaged in battle over earthly affairs. This also means that there's no yin-yang. These are not equal forces. As if we really hope that the good guys win in the end. This is not like the force. You know, George Lucas's uh, immaterial cosmic force that good guys can tap into and bad guys can tap into and you learn how to use it for your benefit and we hope the good guys win. No, this isn't what's going on at all. This is the reality that God has enemies and they are opposed to God's purposes but they always get used to fulfill God's purposes because God wins. He's in charge. There's not a balancing out of the good and the bad. Ephesians 6.12, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Christians, that's where the battle is. The Bible describes, give us, gives us some windows into this demonic and angelic realm. Not many. I don't think we're designed. I don't think God has designed for us to dwell on these things all the time. We're not given instructions on what to do about it other than to put on armor, which are the very real tangible things like read your Bible, believe God, pray, trust Him. But we see the demonic activity in the New Testament. It should be no surprise that when God the Son was here in his earthly ministry, that Satan would unleash in tangible and physical ways his demonic hordes. And so we see demons throwing down humans in violence, driving men naked into the desert, demons talking to Jesus, inhabiting and killing pigs, giving people physical handicaps and blindness and muteness, bending them over. Demons interacting with humans in destructive ways. We shouldn't be surprised to see the New Testament's description of demons' involvement in immaterial ways, in the realm of ideas and thought and doctrine. James 3.15 uh, tells us that there is a false earthly wisdom leading to sin and it is demonic. Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 106, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Timothy 4, and Revelation 9 tells us that behind idolatry and behind all false teaching is demonic activity. Paul calls it the doctrines of demons when there are human false teachers preaching what is not true. We also learn, according to James 2.19, that the demons know the truth and tremble. And then here in Daniel chapter 10, we discover as well that the demons are, are involved in politics, geopolitics, world affairs, and human events. And I'll leave you with this thought this evening. In Romans 16.20, God makes this promise. Still yet future. This promise was not fulfilled at the cross. 
some sort of Christus Victor theology. Certainly Christ got victories at the cross, but this promise is still outstanding. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. And he says he will soon crush Satan under your feet, Christian. This is an echo of the seed promise in Genesis 3.15. That the woman, right after the fall of man into sin, that plunged all the world into sin and death, was promised by God that she would have a seed that would crush the head of the snake. And in Romans 16.20, that promise gets these added words. The snake will be crushed under your feet, Christian. What does that mean? That means the seed promise, the one promised of the woman, will come and crush Satan once and for all. But for all who are in Christ, you are not under his boot as enemies, which is where we started this life. We were children of the snake, enemies of God, disenfranchised, opposed to him, at enmity with him, in the world of darkness, under the dominion of sin. But we have now been transferred out of that kingdom into the kingdom of his beloved son. And we are not to be under the boot of Christ, but with Christ as his body. And under the boot is Satan. That is, under your feet, Christian, Satan will be crushed. That day's coming. Until then, he's a lion roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour. He accuses the brethren before the throne room of God night and day. But his day is coming. And one little word shall fell him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this chapter with the strange windows into another world. But truly the, the real world, though invisible to us, a world of cosmic battle, battle that you always win, a battle that never gets off your short leash, a battle that never goes outside of your superintending sovereign orchestration, a battle in which you are bringing all things around to your glory a battle in which you will put every enemy under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, a battle in which you are accomplishing good things for your saints even while we suffer here and wait and trust in you. You are our fortress, our mighty fortress. And it is to you we sing, it is you we praise, it is you we trust. Amen.